what does exercise do to the brain? And is it important? And if it is, why is it important? Mm. So exercise can help modify the gray matter and the white matter volume of the brain and increase it in size. Now, there's a couple of things that are happening. So when you contract and relax your muscles, we have something called the muscle brain axis. It's funny because you're saying gut brain axis, skin brain axis, yeah. we've got the muscle brain axis. And what happens is we release these muscle-based proteins called myokines. Now, these myokines have a wide range of effects on the brain. They cross the blood-brain barrier. One of them is BDNF. So BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. What it does is it helps the cell survival of the synapses and the neurons. It also helps to create new synapses and quote-unquote makes the brain more integral. They did a study in 2022 and they looked at the post-mortem brains of older individuals that maintained physical activity throughout old age. And they saw more of these presynaptic uh, proteins. So they saw more of these proteins in the presynaptic terminals of the synapses and they correlated that to higher integrity in the brain, more cognitive function, which is really interesting because we've, we know the theory and now we've seen it in, in, in um, pathology as well, which is, is great. They also have other effects like irisin has anxiolytic effects, so it can provide uh, anti-anxiety, you know, quiet, quiet down that amygdala, that limbic system. Now, the interesting thing about these myokines is that, for example, interleukin-6 is generally an inflammatory cytokine when it's released from the liver. When it's released from the muscle, it has anti-inflammatory properties. So even though it's the same molecule, in the way that it's been released has different mechanisms on the brain, which is really interesting. Sure. So, you know, aerobic exercise will help increase BDNF predominantly, and then weight training, predominantly around 70 to 80% of your one rep max, that's where you'll be getting most benefits with this myokine release. Interesting. It's, it's something, I feel like cardiovascular training is probably more broadly studied because it's easier to control. Yes. I feel like there's a lot of other aspects of you know movement and embodiment that are probably incredibly impactful it's just harder to place into like a double blind study in a controlled environment is that yeah i i would say so you know you've got you've got to take into consideration that when you put someone on a stationary bike everyone can move their legs and get their heart rate up yeah you, not everyone can do a proper deadlift not everyone can do right. a proper squat and like then go, go rollerblading outside and you know sunlight. <laughs> it's like what does that do? yeah. yeah um yeah so yeah I would agree, yeah. but, but, you know, we can study athletes, which is, is great. Yeah. And how would exercise compare to meditation? If there was a longer lever for, um, all the terms, synapto, you know, neurogenesis Genesis. and all, yeah. all the, all, all the different things, um, how do they differ? How do they compare Is one, a longer lever towards mental, emotional, cognitive health? Yes. I mean, I would probably argue that exercise maybe has more benefits. Hmm. I don't know. You, we, we haven't studied that, you know, comparatively, but meditation, yes, hundred percent. Yes. Everyone should be doing it. And the interesting thing about meditation and exercise both. So those are actually my two non-negotiables um, on a daily basis. So it's either move or meditate. Like if I can't move for whatever reason, like today I've got quite a busy day. I wanted to get up early. I'm three hours ahead with my circadian rhythm. So I just, it just didn't happen. I've been really diligent at working out on this, on this holiday. Um, but they both have impact on the frontal cortex, but not just that. So they can help strengthen the frontal cortex, which we know is, um, important in executive control, decision-making, more the sort of logical type thinking, that higher order thinking. But not just that, it changes the functional connectivity between the frontal cortex and other areas of the brain, predominantly the limbic system. So when you are triggered by a stressful response or you are feeling emotional or a particular way, we have better top-down regulation to be able to regulate our response. So we don't let that stress or that feeling linger into our whole day we can actually regulate from that pretty quickly and rationalize the situation. And that's what meditation and exercise both do in terms of like how they are comparative. What about hemispheres of the brain? I feel like that's something that I, you know, I, I hear kind of different positions on of like, if I start cooking with my left hand, will I mm -hmm. become a better painter and more creative and start to have, mm -hmm. you know, more dynamic, creative, imaginary ideas start to express because the right hemisphere is Okay. Is that total malarkey? Well, so we stepped away from the left brain, right brain um, type sort of 
left brains being, I think, logical. I can't remember. And right, no, right brains being logical, left brains. One of them. I can't remember. I don't know because it's not right true. Right brain creative. <laughs> right brain creative. Left left lane. Uh, more pragmatic executive. Okay. Done. We've seen. So what happens in the brain is that we have this default mode network which is responsible for internal mind wandering and creativity. And we've seen that it resides on both sides. So it's a network of brain areas that communicate with each other. You know that feeling when you start washing the dishes and you start your mind starts wandering? Someone who's creative will generally have these kind of creative um, thoughts or spontaneous ideas about what to do in their work during those times. Then we have the opposite, which is the central executive network, which is responsible for external um, type thinking. So what we're doing right now, you're not pondering your nine year old life while you're having this conversation with me. I hope not anyway, but if you are, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, those two networks t generally work in tandem, but they reside on both sides. So for example, we process in, we process language on the left side in Broca's area and Bernick's area. Those are two areas of the brain, but then the right side helps with the nuance of conversation. So something like this would require you to understand what I'm trying to tell you, not just listen to the words. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that both, <clears throat> excuse me, both sides of the brain help uh, verbal reasoning. So creativity and logic both reside on both sides of the brain. Mm -hmm. Now, the left brain controls the right, sorry, the, you're on that side. So my, this is my left. My left side will control everything on the right because the, neuro, the the pathways cross at the level of the spinal cord. So the left side controls the right and the right side controls the left. If you were to challenge yourself and start using your left hand for to, to draw, to write, to brush your teeth, etc., you'll be, quote unquote, probably open up, opening up more pathways on the right hand side of the brain, which may just increase your capacity for using the brain. Hmm. I'm just kind of throwing this out there, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're making one more active. I think you're just allowing for more surface area to be used, if that makes sense.